One thing about this pulpit, the other one I could I could have all this stuff and you couldn't see it. <laughs> this whoa! I think they turned that one off and this one on. They'll work they'll work it out in there somehow. But uh, on this on this one, anything that you sit here, we'll have to I'm gonna have to figure a way to hide all this stuff. But that that'll be that'll be for me to do later. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter number eight. The um, the Apostle Paul says in verse number ten, just something, and I'm not going. To, I don't want to try to teach this passage. I just want to. There's something here that he does that I want to explain to you about what I'm going to do. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse number ten, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun who begun before not only to do so, but also to be forward. A year ago, Paul's talking to the Corinthians about an offering for the poor saints of Jerusalem that he'd talked to them a year before about doing. They hadn't fulfilled it. Now he's telling them, you need to get on the ball and get it done. Okay? Did you ever read that verse? And you ever hear anybody say, we make the ministry without charge? Folks brag about doing that. Um, when Paul told that to the Corinthians, you know where that's at? In the Bible, it's in First Corinthians nine. When Paul told the Corinthians that he wasn't complimenting them, go back and read the chapter. He he was saying he said in Second Corinthians ten he said I robbed other churches, took wages of them to serve you. The Corinthians were probably the most affluent congregation that Paul ministered to. And yet the Philippians and the Thessalonians who were poor, if you look back at verse 3, this chapter, um, he says, for they, for, are you talking about the saints in Macedonia? Um, verse number 2, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. They were poor folks financially. And yet they gave way beyond their measure. In fact, when you read Paul talk about it, it's almost like he's embarrassed to take money from them because they, they, they were just giving money they didn't have. You know, they're taking money out, food out of their mouth, so to speak, to give. The Corinthians had a lot of money, sat around, didn't do anything. You'll, you'll discover in the work of the ministry that's almost the way it works. <laughs> you know, it really is. It, it's, it's a strange thing. Uh, people with a lot of money don't like to give the money unless they can tell you how to spend the money. Put their name on the wall, that kind of stuff. Really, it's true. And I've turned down people offer to give us money, but they want to tell you you got to do this with it. And I tell people, I don't let you tell me what my ministry is. I decide that. That's my job to know what my ministry is. And if you want, if I'm going to do something and you want to help with it, then you're welcome. But you don't come and tell me. I I, I just learned not to do that. A lot of folks don't learn that till it's too late. You got a noose around your neck. But when he told them, "I made the ministry without charge," he wasn't bragging on himself or them. Now Paul did that when he's at Corinth. Go back and read the text. He 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 labored. With, that you know the passage about being a tent maker. That was at Corinth. Dude had to go work <laughs> among these people who had plenty of ability to make him to allow him not to work. So he wasn't bragging about making the ministry of no charge, he was telling them, in essence, I had to do that because you were derelict in your duty. So when he's talking about these things in this chapter, what he's doing in 8 and 9 is he's giving them instructions, and it's sort of like, you guys, you guys said you were going to do something. I'm coming down there, and when I get there, I'm going to expect you to do it. And so he's kind of warning them, and he's giving them the motivation and the instructions how to do it. But verse 10, when he says, Herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you. And I don't know about you, but there's certain people when they when they start wanting to give you advice, I perk up and listen. Certainly when the Apostle Paul wanted to give somebody advice, I'd want to listen to what he had to say. And the older, as I've gotten older, I've, I've realized that... Um, one, I spent most of my ministry not wanting to give anybody advice. 
when we started Grace School of the Bible, I didn't have any intention of doing what we've done. I never have sat down. When we started the school, we didn't even have a name for it. When Ted, Alex, and Greg, these guys graduated, they didn't graduate. They graduated from the pastor's training class. And we, we called it that because we had to have some kind of identifying moniker so they knew what they were. What, what are you doing on Tuesday and Wednesday night? Well, we're going to the pastor's training class. And when we set out on our own to how actually establish a school, we, we, we came up with the name Grace School of the Bible because we had to uh, have some kind of name that distinguished who we were. But one of the things I learned to do was I never told people, we're going to do this. I always felt like, go do it and let the doing commend itself. You, you, you see the difference in that. Most people say, we're going to do this, and you know, God's let us do that, and we're going to accomplish this. And, and you never really get, you know, either you don't get done what you said you were going to do, or you kill yourself and others trying to do it just because you said you were going to do it. And I've never been able to see um, outside the local church, and even in the local church, it's hard to exactly know what you're going to do. You, you, you know, it's a day-to-day, -to -day, month to month week-to-week -week kind of thing. And uh, you have a vision, you have a place that you want to go, but then you, you zigzag and tack and push to get there. But the older I've gotten, and, and by the way, people used to ask me, say, well, why don't, you, why don't you teach classes on child raising, on marriage? I finally was provoked into doing a series on marriage back in the 90s, and, and you know, it's available and so forth. And a few years ago, we had a marriage seminar here. Uh, and we filled this room up with people that didn't go to the church, you know, just in the community. People are interested in those things. Those kind of things are popular. And I always felt like, uh, why should I tell you how to raise kids until I've raised my own? You see somebody, you see some, you know, uh, there's a reason Titus says, let the older women teach the younger women. You have a bunch of 25, 30-year-old ladies telling people how to, how, how, to be a, how to be a happy, successful wife. And I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> uh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe you ought to have about 30 years in doing it and then tell me. <laughs> Same thing with guys. You know, we, we, we do it. And we, let, let what, that verse in 2 Corinthians 4 when he says, by uh, manifestation of the truth, commending yourself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I, I'm, I'm grateful I learned to take that to heart early. Go do the work of the ministry and let the work of the ministry commend itself. Let it be the issue. The thing that's expedient, that's the thing that's of best long-term advantage. What works? And what these weekends are, th this is really not a Bible conference. This is we, we start out calling this the men's conference, the school meeting. And First time we ever met, we met at the, the uh, church there on Neva. We were still having the school then. And as, as we met, we had, I don't know, 30, 30 guys, 15, 20, 30 guys. I don't remember how many that were. Just a little handful of fellows. And we, we had that next year, we went down to uh, Ridge Farm. I remember going down there. And I, actually, next year, we went to Pennsylvania, sleeping on the, on the floor. I remember at, at Crossroads there, and I had... <laughs> We've done some weird things. We had a week of, we, one time we had a week, guys here for a whole week, and uh, boy, I decided I'd never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Having you around for a week was, <laughs> was a real chore. <laughs> but we put people in different homes in the church and so forth. That's, that's the weekend when Daryl Mefford and uh, uh, Doug Dodd stayed with one of the ladies in our assembly, and uh, she's a real sweet lady and, and very proper, and they're staying upstairs in, 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 in her apartment, and she's downstairs, and she had an upstairs apartment that she rented out, and that lady stayed down with her and let Daryl and, and uh, Doug stay up there. And the first morning they were there, uh, Daryl calls down, and he says, uh, Mari, her name was Mari, her name was Mary, Mari, you got Orn? An arn. We need an arn. And she told me, she says, Brother Rick, I was so embarrassed. I could not understand a word he said. 
I need an Arn, an I R O N Arn. <laughs> and so we we had we had wonderful times, but we realized that maybe we needed to do it a little differently. We went down to the Catholic Retreat Center in Ridge Farm, but we we, we always call it men's meeting. And uh, Fran, when Fran came, she'd say, "Yeah, but I'm here." <laughs> And, oh, well, okay, but it's still a men's meeting. And as time has gone on, we've gotten ladies in the school and so forth, and now we have, you know, a sprinkling of ladies here with us, and we're certainly happy to have it. It makes it much easier and better for us when you're here. But uh, the purpose of these meetings has been really, probably first of all, uh, a, a, a weekend for me of personal privilege. I get to talk to you. I don't get to see you week in and week out when you have an extension school. I trust the ministry, if, if you're in a local church, and the, 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 the ideal way to do Grace School of the Bible is to have it work through your local assembly. You work under the leadership of your assembly. You're accountable to the leadership of your assembly. And all I do is provide the curriculum, and then they provide all of the philosophy and the, and, and the, the hands-on experience in, in the ministry. And that's, that's the greatest way. That's the way to do it. And we have a number of churches that do that and, and just use it that way. Others of you don't have assemblies, and we, you, know, you deal directly with us. But I don't get a chance to see you except now. What you're watching is stuff that from, you know, from some years ago. And so I, I've, I have, through the last 20 years or so, used this weekend as just an opportunity for me to talk to you about what I see going on and to try to give you a, a sort of a, of a feel for what, what I see and I perceive as a pastor uh, of a local church and uh, as somebody who is out among you, uh, just to give a little bit of idea about what I see, the direction of ministry going, and to try to alert you about things that are ahead. Uh, are ahead. I've always been a kind of a big picture person uh, and, and look off at the horizon of things and, and see the movements and the things that are coming. And I've, I've always tried to use this as that kind of a, of a thing. I understand there's another reason. You need to have the fellowship that you see other people. You know, one thing I learned early on, you get a bunch of preachers together and a bunch of workers together, and the word discouragement shows up. Because you push in the ministry, you work in the ministry, you, you, you face the frustrations of the ministry. If you deal with people, you're going to deal with frustrations. They don't come in that door whole. They come in that door broken. They come in that door screwed up. They come sit in here, and the gospel can change them, but they have to make the choice to let it change them. If they come in the door whole, they didn't need you. Okay. But dealing with people like that, and you teach people, and you, you share, and there's frustra and you get frustrated. You get opposition. You get people, I don't want to believe that. People have told me right here, you know, I say, How, how's the ministry going? They say, well, you know, so-and-so just left. <laughs> well, it hurts when people leave, you know. Maybe they didn't like the way you cut your hair. Maybe they didn't like the doctrine. Whatever it is, it makes them leave. They sometimes, and you, you get people, you put your life in them, and, and discouragement comes. You come here and sit down and sit, talk to one another, and you know what you find out? you got plenty of company. <laughs> Everything's happening to you. It's happening to somebody else. There's no temptation taking you, but such is as common to man. So you get you guys together, and you can say, Woo, we got fellowship of our sufferings. <laughs> and there is an encouragement in that, not in, in there. That, oh, yeah, we're not the only one. This isn't such a strange thing. I'm not being singled out. And there's a sense of unity. There are other people crazy enough to believe what we believe. And there are people who are willing to, uh, to stand up for what we believe. And there's a refreshing in that. Discouragement only knows one word. That's quit. And if there's anything that we can do in the weekend like this, my heart is to tell you don't quit. It's too soon to quit. That's what Paul told Titus when he wrote Titus. It's too soon to quit. Because if you don't quit, pretty soon you'll find out a reason to keep going. And that reason was always there. It's because the truth of the gospel, the work of the ministry requires it. And I'd also like you to see a little bit of the vision. I don't want you to have a ministry that, where you navel gaze. Where you're just looking at yourself. I watch people... 
I do Facebook. You do Facebook? I don't do, I don't t use Facebook to teach. I, I use it as a, when I had cancer back in 07, uh, we were getting all kind of phone calls about how you doing, what's up. And so I, I thought, well, instead of getting 30 phone calls a day, what if I start a blog? You know what blogs are. And back in the, in the O's, that was the big thing, wasn't it, Facebook back then. That's when I started blogging. Well, it, a little while later, Facebook came along, and that kind of took over the blogging. But I just use it for the social media. I don't, I, don't do, I don't try to teach. I have other things, other ministries to teach with. But I watch people that are on Facebook and on blogs. And uh, I've got a few friends on Facebook, and I, I look around, I see what goes on. And I'm amazed at the stupidity, the shallowness, the crazy teaching, the arguing. And what Facebook does and what the Internet does is it lets every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there have the same status as the people that ought to be listened to. One of the things that happens in a local church is teachers have to qualify themselves to the saints to be teachers. You understand that? Everybody shouldn't be a teacher. Some folks need to be learners. They aren't ready to be teachers. In a local church, the dude that's not ready to be a teacher doesn't wind up being a teacher, but he can be a teacher on the Internet because he's not accountable to anybody. One guy gets on there, he says, well, I, you know, I've been a pastor for 20 years. Of course, I've closed up every church I've ever pastored for the 20 years. <laughs> And say, so, well, who says you're a pastor? I do. First Timothy 3 says you shouldn't say you're an elder. You don't get to say you're a bishop. The congregation gets to say you are. You don't get to say you're a deacon. The congregation gets to say you are. In other words, the ministry commends itself. By manifestation and through to you, commends yourself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So there's a, there's a common day. There is a, a safety that the local church affords that the internet doesn't and yet you have to be careful now i understand there's a there's a wonderful opportunity to share things and to learn things and i think you ought to use it and we do use it for that we're on the internet right now and i'm not poking fun at the internet we use it and our meetings on sunday we'll have 150 200 people in this room we'll have 200 250 hookups on the internet that's probably twice as many people on the internet as are in here because the hookups, one person, sometime two, there's one, two, two or three places, one place got 40 people watching. So I'm for the Internet. I'm for using it. I'm not poking fun at it. I'm just saying there's a, the, 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 that something like Facebook, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a, I know there's a lot of screwball stuff going on too. And you don't have a way to qualify people uh, the way you do in a local church. The... The reason I got involved in the Facebook, as I said, was just for the social media. So I don't do a lot of teaching on it. I, I try not to do that in other places. But the opportunity to, to see what's going on out there, and I see these things, and I think, wow. <laughs> but you, you need to have a vision that looks. What happens, and I know that, that well, the one thing I notice the most of on Facebook is, is what I call navel-gazing. You, you see all these guys talking about how terrible the grace movement is. They're in the grace movement, say they are. But the grace movement isn't this, and it doesn't do that, and doesn't do the other thing, and doesn't do the other thing. Listen, the grace movement is where you are. Your responsibility in the grace movement is not Shoreward Bible Church. That's my responsibility. You understand that? You need to get that through your head. Your responsibility for the grace movement is where you are. We're not a denomination. There are no denominations. The body, if you can appreciate the fact that the body of Christ belongs to him, he'll take care of it himself, thank you. You be responsible for the part where you are. Tom read that verse last night. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. There's a little garden outside this room here, out there that our folks tend to. And they put little patches. That's Rochelle's patch, and this is somebody else's patch, and that's somebody else's patch. And they tend to their little patches. And then if that patch gets overrun with weeds, <laughs> that's Rochelle's problem. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy next to it, well, he keeps his clean. 
And if her weeds get on his place, he plucks them out. And he might go over and pull a few weeds for her, but that's your responsibility first is to your responsibility. And boy, when you see that, you say, wow. Because what happens is people are always talking about how terrible everybody else is. And they get what I call the, you want to be a big fish in, a, a big fish in the pond. If you want to be a big fish, get in a little pond. You can always get in a pond small enough to be a big fish. I went one time to a pastor's meeting. A guy asked me, he said, come, come go with me. This, there were 8,000 people in this, audit, in this auditorium. The pastor that, you, that was putting on the pastor's meeting pastored a church that had 8,000 people on, on a, in a meeting. They filled the auditorium up twice every Sunday. I said, that's, a, that's oh. You know what I wanted to do? You know why I went there? If you have 8,000 people in your Sunday school, you know how many people you got in your nursery? You probably got 800 kids in the... What do you do with the pampers? <laughs> ah, that's what I went down there for. I said, I want to see a nursery of 800. How do you not lose a kid? <laughs> we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> And you're going to change them twice. Because <laughs> you've got to change them while they're there. And before you give them back to mama, you want to send them home clean so they'll bring them back. You know how many pampers that is? I've raised kids. I've got grandkids. I know what pampers are. we didn't have when we had kids, but we got grandkids. Man, not only is that a lot of money, that's a lot of garbage. And I went down there to see what do they do with the pampers. I didn't care about all that other stuff. I wasn't going to do that anyway. Now you want to know what they did with the Pampers, don't you? <laughs> they were organizational geniuses. They didn't have, they, they, no nursery had more than 50 kids in it. That was the first key. So now it's manageable. And then they just had a constant garbage patrol. <laughs> they had a guy with a little, little uh, golf cart thing with a, with a trailer in the back of it going around collecting the, the black bags. That's how they did it. But they had it organized. And I was, wow, I saw the thing. I got talking to the guy and found out what he did. I put it out there. And they filled up two big dumpsters every meeting, just like I thought they would, of uh, Pampers. If I was them, I'd have figured a way to recycle that and sell it. <laughs> they probably, <laughs> they may have by now. <laughs> but uh, now that, like, I, I tell you that, it's funny, but it, that's just explained to you why. What I want to tell you was, the guy in the, uh, the when he's talking, he was talking about people criticizing him, and he said, "This one fellow is criticizing us, and he's bragging about the fact that he has an overflow crowd." Now, if you've got eight thousand people, you got probably more than anybody you know. And it's not many people can have more people than you are, so he's bragging about that. This guy's criticizing him. He said, "We have an overflow crowd, and we don't do this." And the guy says. You can always rent a room small enough to have an overflow crowd. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. Because size isn't really the issue. Now, you know when you preach the, the grace message that things are going to be, you're going to be the few of many. You understand that. But you're going to be the few. You're going to be, there's going to be some of you. And your responsibility, if you can get anything out of, out of a weekend like this, go home with an understanding of your responsibility isn't way over yonder. Your responsibility is where you are. If you don't have a grace church in your town, you're mistaken. You go out in front of your house, turn around, take a picture of it, send it to me and say, there's the grace church where I live. then you just go do the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry, what's God's will? All men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You go do the work of the ministry. Intentionally try to get the gospel to lost people. Quit sitting around the table talking about how terrible things are and go out and find some lost people. You know how to find lost people? Just go stand right out on that street corner. By the way, that corner right out here at Euclid and Hicks, there is a red light camera on that corner that will cost you a hundred dollars 
If you turn right on red, don't do it. Okay? That's enough said. If you need to understand how that works, Bob DeCarlo's in the media room. Ask him. He's paid three tickets <laughs> recently for turning right on red. There is a way to do it legally, but you can't figure out what it is. I just tell you because I don't want you to go home. One of the brothers said he ran a, a toll and on the toll road. Well, you can get away with that for a time or two, and that's only a buck anyway. But that's 100 bucks, and you won't get away. They'll chase you down. That's free. That, that saved you some money. You can put it in the offering tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just, just don't turn right on red, okay? And that's the safest way. Uh, not, not to get caught. And don't run the red light going that way. Coming this way doesn't matter. It, it, it's, it's only going that way. They're only trying to get people coming out of the industrial complex going that way. Anyway, come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. All of that was just stream of consciousness. didn't have anything to do with what I want to talk to you about. I want you to be able to go home from these meetings with a, a sense of really what we're all about. This, this, for me, this is, this is a ministry weekend. This pulpit represents for me a ministry that comes from this period of the, of the you know, this pulpit's over 100 years old, by the way. The furniture in the, in the old building was put in the building. They, the building was built in 1900, and it was furnished uh, along, at that time which means this, this pulpit would have been put in the, the old building around 1900, somewhere between 1900 and 1901 or two along in there. They built the, they built the building, the auditorium, 1900, and had it paid for by 1910. That was uh, quite a feat. But uh, anyway, ministry that you do, you can always be worried about the other guy over yonder. You want to Tell him what to do. Tell him what he's doing wrong. But your responsibility is where you are. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm not unmindful of all the others and unmindful of that kind of stuff, being an encouragement to it, being, being watch, watching it and being, having watch care. But when you're only looking at your own self and your own, your own situation or those of others, and you, you wind up in a circle, I want you to be able to see Jesus told the disciples, look at, lift, look at the field, they're white to harvest. Get a, big, get a picture of what's out there. And 2 Timothy 3, he says in verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now when he says perilous times, come back over with me, to sec, hold hand there, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just in case you, you, you need a, a definition of what perilous is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. If you start in verse 24, it says, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. I, I just read that and I think, Oh, me. I thought I had it hard just because somebody said something nasty to me or about me. Five times. The only one you read, and, and, and you don't read about them in the book of Acts. So one time in Acts 16, you see him get beat up. But five to, he wrote this in Acts 20. Prior to that, five times this guy's been beat like that. You get 39 lashes, you know how long it takes to get over. You see that thing in Saudi Arabia recently where the, where, where the guy got, got, got the lashes for doing something and they put it on the TV, and he almost died. And Paul didn't have a, he didn't have, you know, the emergency, emergency people to call. He didn't have the antibiotics you got. I don't know about you, I've been thinking about going home. Thrice. I was beaten with rods. It isn't enough just to get, get, get the, the, the lashes, the stripes. Now they beat me up with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. 
Three times the, 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 the dude gets wrecked. This Acts 20, the one you read in, Acts, in the book of Acts is Acts 27. That's another one. comes later. A night and a day have I been in the deep. That's prior to Acts 27. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been overboard at sea, hanging on a, a beam, they didn't have life jackets like we do. A night and a day hanging on trying to wait for somebody to rescue you. You don't get, you don't get shipwrecked in, in calm seas. I mean, this guy, you say, why was he out there? Because he's trying to make a date to preach the gospel on the other shore. I read this and I think, we usually read this kind of quick. But when you read it and you really think about it, you say, whoa, I just thought I had some problems. I mean, you know, you learn when you're a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. And because somebody said something nasty about you, you got all mad and went and wanted to have a fight. Wait till some of this happens. You know what Paul did in response? Nothing. He just preached. No retaliation. In journeyings often, I've got that one underlined in my Bible because I relate to that one. In perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, <laughs> in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, nakedness. You get the idea this guy had a tough life. When Paul says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Think about that verse, verse 26. Look at all the perils. He's not just talking about bad doctrine happening. He's talking about your life is going to get to the place where it can be in danger. Perils. He's talking about danger. Not just, well, people don't want to li listen to us or people don't vote like I want them to vote. None of that's in it at all. There's going to come a time, and Paul says, where your very existence is going to be in danger. Mine was. Perilous times, dangerous times. Now go back to 2 Timothy. For men should be lovers of themselves, of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Boy, you read that and say, whew. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses and, uh, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Can I tell you, folks, there, we're there. Just go out and look at any gospel track. Go out and talk to any seminary graduate go out here and stand on the street corner I challenge you when you go home sometime in the next 30 days get a handful of tracks and go stand on the main corner of your community and, and pass them out for an hour you'll learn more about what's going on in your town than reading the newspaper watching Fox News or MSNBC, listening to the... Pre you'll, you'll learn more about the reality of what's going on in your community than any other way. And you know what you'll find? You'll find that passage right there in living color. I do that. About twice a year, I, I go downtown Chicago and do that. 
I love Chicago. I know you don't, but I do. <laughs> the whole world's in Chicago. And you can go downtown and pass out tracks for a little while, and you, it, it will stun you. See, we live in this little tribe of people that think like we think, believe like we believe. And that's good. <laughs> but you get out there, and they got no idea what's going on. And you meet religious people, people that don't have any idea. The world as you and I have known it is over, folks. If you're my age, the world you grew up in is over. The tipping point has already been reached. The cultural change is there. And you can join the chorus that's screaming and hollering about it because they are losing their money. That's all the reason they're calling about it. And whistle in the wind. Or you can take what God's word says to do in the face of that and do that and count. We're here to do the latter. What do you do in the face of all that? Verse number 10. But thou. Paul does this. He'll say this, 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 this. But thou. You're not part of that. Here's what you do. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came unto me in Antioch, at, I at Iconium and Lystra. That's back in Acts 13 and 14. That's when he got stoned to death back there. <laughs> I mean, this stuff going on in Paul's life at the end of his ministry began at the first of his ministry. And it began back there because of the satanic opposition against the prophetic program and, and, and the, the little flock there in the, in the Pentecostal era. When God changed the program, Satan knew he changed the program and he knew where to start persecuting. He quit persecuting the Pentecostal uh, uh, church and he started persecuting Paul. Listen, religious people not, might not know what God's doing today, but the devil does. And knows what to, what, what to oppose. And he did. And Paul said, this stuff's been going on since the very beginning. Verse 12, yea, and all that, underline that next word, will live godly in Christ Jesus. He didn't say all that it lived godly in Christ Jesus because when are you, you, you listen to what Tom said to you last night about the judgment seat of Christ. That, that passage in 1 Corinthians 4 just, it, 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 if it doesn't keep you on your knees before God, I don't know what would. Paul said, I don't even know how to judge myself. You stand up and say, boy, I'm doing it right. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. How do you know? Paul said, you don't. So I know what the verses are, and I'm doing the verse. You ever read 1 Corinthians 13? He said, I can give my body to be burned. If I don't have charity, it profits me nothing. I can do all these wonderful things if I don't have charity. If I don't have that divine viewpoint in my heart that produces it, if it's not the love of Christ constraining me because I thus judge, it's profits nothing. It can be right. It can be every I dotted, every T crossed. And it'll profit others. But how do you ever know for sure what your motives are? I can tell you one thing. As soon as you think you know, you don't know. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And that next verse says, I, the Lord, try the reins of the heart. And when you think you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you need to go sit down, take a breath, and re-examine things. An old preacher used to say, he said, the closer you get to the light, the better you see the dirt. Get real close, you see the dirt under your fingernails. The closer you get to who you are in Christ, the more you say, it's not I, it's Christ. And when you do ministry, guys, that's where it has to come from. Now, you can go be profitable to others, but if you're going to have some profit at the judgment seat of Christ, that's where it's got to come from. So I'm glad he says, yea, all that, that will. My heart is toward this. 
how I'm doing, I'm going to wait for the Lord to decide. I can't. I'll do the, I, I, I mean, I'm not talking about being lax in it. I'm talking about focus on it and press toward the mark as best you can, as, as, as fervent as you can, as, as, as sure as you can, as true as you can. But just know it's going to be him that decides, not you. So when you think you're the rightest, you always keep that little humble part that says, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. And by the way, I know the context of that passage. I had somebody send me a note recently said, well, Brother Jordan, you quote that verse out of context. No, I know the context in that chapter. <laughs> and I'm not quoting it out of context. I know the context in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Thank you. And you know what it is? It's one of those, yea, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, statements of Paul. Where it says, you see Israel, they started out with every blessing and privilege that God gave them. And what did they do? They wound up in the flesh. Thinking they were doing God's work. Don't you do that. Be on guard. That's commercial, too. <laughs> yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Your ministry is not going to save the culture. <laughs> now, what everybody's out there trying to do? Let's save America. Your ministry is not going to save America. That's not your job. When we say we are premillennial, Bible-believing, dispensationalist, a premillennialist says that the culture isn't going to be saved until Jesus Christ comes back and sets up His government. If you've got the government fixed the way you want it, better than anybody ever else did it, it wouldn't last because dudes like you are going to be in charge of it. I'm not talking about being culturally irrelevant. We'll talk about that in a little while. How to be relevant. But right now, I'm just trying to warm up a little bit. <laughs> and I want you to understand, we face some difficult times. And you're going to need the courage of the conviction of grace to see them through. Or you're going to be swept away. Evil men and seducers, evil men, bad guys that want to make life, your life perilous, perils of the wilderness, perils in the city. All these perils Paul faced came from evil men, lewd fellows of the baser sort. I love that. <laughs> they look nice, but that's how God thinks of them. And they used the government, went and got a peace bond from the government against Paul so he couldn't do the work of the ministry. And Paul writes Titus in Titus chapter 3. He says, you put those people at Crete in mind, put them in the church at mind to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man. In the context of the government, you're to speak evil of no man. Some of you are going to have to quit talking about politics. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you owe some letters of apology to some politicians. <laughs> you ought to go read Titus 3. He tells you why. For you were sometime foolish, disobedient. You know what it is to be lost. Why are you mad at a lost man for acting like a lost man? Amen. You want to change what a lost man does? Get him saved. That's what makes a difference. And you're letting the devil and the religious system steal time from grace people that ought to be preaching the grace message, doing stuff that has no impact for eternity. 
It might make your life a little easier this week. It might keep your savings a little more secure this week. But listen, Paul said perilous times are going to come and they're going to take your savings. They're going to take your safety. They're going to take all of that away. And they weren't real anyway. Marvin sang that song last night. Some call it heaven. I call it home. Some say it's a dream. Let me dream on. <laughs> Some call it paradise. <laughs> oh, listen, that's what's real. Everything you're trying to hang on to, you're going to lose anyway. Naked you came in, naked you go out, but the eternal stuff never goes away. Amen. But continue thou, verse 14, in the things which thou hast learned. Here we are. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, being assured of those of who thou hast learned them. and been assured of, knowing of who, continue the things you've learned and been assured of. When you start, listen, you guys are in the school, you're learning. And I've been, I've been there, done that. Everything in that school, I spent seven years teaching myself, putting that material together back in the 70s. I didn't have anybody to do it for me. The structure of the curriculum is not by accident. It's based on what we see in Paul's epistles. And the whole goal behind it, listen, if you want to be like everybody else, go where, go where everybody else goes. But when we realize Paul's our apostle, and Paul tells God through Paul says right to divide the word, so we say, Paul, how do you do it? It works, doesn't it? And Paul says, perfected saints do the work of the ministry. So you say, Paul, how do you get a perfected saint? And he tells you. And if you do it, it works. Now, I knew that, believing the verses. I tried it. It worked in my own life. And I've done it. It's worked in you. But I didn't need any of that confirmation. I had what God said. But I like to say, you know it and you've been assured of as you are learning that zeal that you have to, to, to do, put it in where it needs to be. It needs to be in you gaining that maturity, that perfection of the doctrine. Don't get the cart before the horse. Get the information, learn it, and be assured of. Get that assurance that the truth gives you because it's out of that that you're going to minister. And tells Timothy that from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. The salvation in that chapter is not just getting saved from hell. Salvation is a big thing. We're saved from the penalty of sin. We're saved from the power of sin. We're saved from the apostasy of sin. Ultimately from the presence of sin. And the scriptures, what it's in the scripture that you get that salvation, that deliverance. In the context here, it's deliverance from the evil men and seducers who come along. And listen, they'll seduce you. The first 10 years of my ministry, the 1970s, moved up in central Alabama to help start a little church there. And I had learned by then. The seducers were out there. I started preaching in a rescue mission. And it, I, it was so fortunate for me. My first Bible teacher, Roy Lange, was a grace preacher. He taught me to study Paul. The first ministry I had was with Brother Clyde Reynolds at the rescue mission in Mobile. And Brother Reynolds was a grace believer. And I was fortunate to learn not just to study the Bible, but to minister from men who understood dispensational truth. And they also understood something about the grace life that a lot of right dividers don't understand. We, I used to work with Brother Reynolds in the, in, in, in the ministry there, and I watched the seduction 
tried to come to the conclusion. Have you ever read Mr. Stam's book, The Controversy? If you don't have a copy of that, you need to get a copy. They, they, for some reason, they've let it go out of print. And it, it's, a, it's a crying shame. Things that differ, the first volume of the book of Acts, Our Great Commission, Paul's Apostleship and Ministry, and the Controversy are five books you need to have in your library. You need to read them over and over. You're not going to agree with everything in them. We know some things that he didn't know when he wrote those books in the 50s, but they're foundational. The controversy, has the, has, it has every objection you will ever hear to the distinctive ministry of Paul and the scriptural answer. I learned as a young preacher that I needed to review that. I read every January, that was the first book I read. I read my Bible and all this, but I'm, every January I would reread that book. And it used to startle me how I would find that there were places in that book I had drifted a little bit. I never departed, but just kind of drift a little bit. But that's how you depart. You begin to drift. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't, then you better read the book because... <laughs> <laughs> and well, in other words, you have to constantly be honing, bringing yourself back. Seduction. And they'll seduce you with good things, not just bad things. Nobody's going to seduce you. I shouldn't say nobody. Most of what's going to be used to seduce you is not evil, terrible, bad things. Oh, I'm teaching a lie. There's no line of truth, but there can be a lot of truth in a lie. The salvation here is from that. Now, when you understand that that kind of that's that's the world we live in, that's our context. Come back with me to First Corinthians chapter four. I'm just trying to say to you, you need courage. You're going to need courage, folks. This isn't something for the faint-hearted. This is something that's going to take some intestinal fortitude in your inner man. If you just want to float down the way, if you want to have a you know fly, float through the uh, flowery bed of ease, th the ministry of the gospel of the grace of God is not the place to be. Go be a Baptist, you can get along. Go be a Lutheran, you can make money. Not preaching grace. You can preach the gospel being a Baptist. You can preach the gospel being a Lutheran. Did you know that? But you're not going to be very faithful beyond that. That's something. I'm proud of that. I'm happy for that. And if you want a bed of ease, that's where you go. But if your heart wants to say, no, that's not what I want. I want what, what God's doing. You're going to need some intestinal fortitude that look yourself, not everybody else, yourself dead in the eye and call a spade a spade in your life. Call truth a, a, a truth and error in your life. I'm not so worried about you as I am about me. I want to be true. Now, after I've made sure that's where I'm at, then if I can help you, okay. But how am I going to help you if I'm seduced? Where did I tell you to go? 1 Corinthians 4. We read the verse a minute ago about Paul, the perilous times. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. For I speak, I'm sorry, for I think that God has set us, the apostles, set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death. He said, it's just like he stuck us out here to get killed. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise. We are weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we're despised. You know what, what, being, what makes being a fool for Christ and weak? and despised 
so harsh in that verse is that the other people weren't. We're fools for Christ, but you're wise. Well, you know what a fool this you got you are? Look at this brother over here, how smart he is. Y'all preach the same thing. Well, the guy saying that, is he right or is he wrong? Well, he, he's, got, he's dull of hearing and he's right. If he's clear of hearing, he's wrong. But when you have to be willing to appear foolish. You have to be willing to appear weak. How many people y'all got in y'all's church? Well, we got more than Noah had on the ark. <laughs> got that many in my family. That's why we recommend having big families. <laughs> but you know how that makes you feel. Because they're saying, we're strong. We started with 35, we got 500 now. How y'all doing? I saw a letter one time a guy wrote Ted said, How many are you running, brother? <laughs> you hear him? None of them. They're doing fine on their own. He's not running any of them. <laughs> now what is it? it it's, to, it's to shame you. And you don't like to be shamed. Paul said, His grace is made perfect in my... But we don't like to appear weak. It takes some spiritual fortitude in your inner man to be willing to appear weak. 2 Corinthians 13 said it was through weakness that Jesus was crucified. Not a kick in the seat of the pants. Weakness? No, it looked like weakness, didn't it? But we know it is the power of God. Verse 11, even into this present hour. And that's in Acts 19. Paul isn't way long in the ministry here. This is Acts 19. You know, we think of him dying all broken alone in, 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 in Rome in the jail in 2 Timothy 4. This is Acts 19 he's writing this. Even under this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted and, and have no certain dwelling place. Whoa! You got food in the refrigerator? You got a house to live in? You got clothes to wear? You're ahead of Paul. You might have some perilous times coming. That means you don't get that nice house. Dude, if you've got a wife, that's going, to be a, that, that's going to be an issue. The wonderful thing about ladies in your life is they bring a culture that men don't. Men don't care if they don't have clothes. They put on anything. <laughs> Most of you spend maybe 30 seconds to two minutes in front of the mirror in the morning. And most of that's brushing your teeth. A lot of us don't have enough hair to spend more than 30 seconds on. Your wife, what she spend? Somewhere between 20 minutes and an hour? And she looked better than you to start with. When she started, she looks better than you did when you finished. But it means more to the ladies. Paul says when you have a wife, you, you, have, you have the cares of life. And she buys into a life of What do you say? Hunger, thirst, naked, buffeted, no certain dwelling place. By the way, ministry is a joint effort. It's you and a spouse. Laboring, working with our own hands. Ministry is work. A lot of times you work to pay for the bills. A lot of times you work to pay... To preach. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. Being defamed, slandered. 
You're going to learn some things about that. I've had all those things happen to me. Probably at a scale that most of you won't have to endure. And every time those things happen, I think, you're watching. I think my people are watching to see how to react. If it happened to you, there are going to be people watching you. Don't go romping, stomping, reviling back. Defamed, we entreat. Reviled, we bless. Persecuted, we take it. Paul said an example. When you go through it, you know what you need to do? Remember, there are other people watching. I wrote not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Notice Paul considered the Corinthians to be sons. You hear all this stuff about you have to grow to be a son? The Corinthians hadn't grown very far. Chapter 3 says they're carnal. They're a mess. They weren't living like who they were in Christ Jesus. But Paul said, I know who you are. You know who you are? You're a son of God. That's who God says you are. Now, come with me to Philippians chapter 1. I, I, I don't want to just leave you with that. <laughs> I, I, I'm going over, I go over those verses just so you understand. There's a need for courage. We live in a time when it's, when it's, when it's greatly needed. Philippians chapter 1 is a passage of Scripture where Paul describes what the ministry philosophy that you ought to have ought to be. He says he's set for the defense and confirmation of the gospel. He writes to the Philippians, and at the end of chapter 1, and if you ever, if you ever wanted to develop a, a philosophy or principle or thinking pattern for the ministry, the, this this is a is a is a when you try to develop something you need to have a a goal in mind and here here are the marks when Paul tells a local church when you're shooting at the target here's the target chapter one verse twenty seven only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. Okay, well, what does that mean? That whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. If I'm there with you or if I hear about you, which means it's legitimate to do both, okay? That you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Those three things. You stand fast in one spirit. The picture there is a soldier. Here's, a, here, here's soldiers in a battle. Don't let someone move you off. You know the passage in Ephesians 6 about the armor? Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil that you may be able to withstand. They're trying to push you off. And having done all that you might stand. You don't have the armor to take the ground. The ground's already yours in Christ. You're to stand in who God's made you in Christ. Every piece of that armor is, is an aspect of who you are in Christ. Stand in that. Use that. Use the identity God gives you because the adversary is going to try to push you off he can't take you out of Christ. He can just try to get you not to stand there. And we're to stand fast, firm, don't move. 
We don't give any ground to the adversary. So we're going to stand fast in one spirit. We're going to have one mind that stands for the truth. I said last night, I've said it many times, Brother Lange told me years ago, the hardest thing you ever do is work together with other believers in a local church. That's why it's one of the greatest privileges you have. Because you learn that you have to put yourself out of the way. So he says, Stri with one mind, striving together <laughs> for the faith of the gospel. When you're standing and not giving ground, you have to have the teamwork of an athlete. And you strive together with one mind. You guys like sports? I never could play basketball. I, the eye-hand coordination, my, my sight never was good enough to do that. So I never cared for it. I never saw hockey until I moved to Chicago. We could put three hockey teams on, on the floor out of our assembly right here. We couldn't put a baseball team together if we had to, but we could put three hockey teams. Our guys love hockey. And I can't, keep, I can't follow the puck well enough. I, I go watch them just to watch the guys fall and bounce off the ice. <laughs> but in a team sport, I played baseball. And baseball is interesting because you have to know how to play. And you have to play as an individual. You got to play your part, but you got to play it in relationship to a team. I discover every team effort's that way. The work of the ministry is that way. Working in a local church is that way. It isn't just you. It is you. You got to do your part. Find a place, but then you have to learn to work with everybody else. And when you work with other people, you know what happens? You rub up against each other and you have disagreements, and you have to learn that it, maybe they revile me. Maybe they say something insulting to me. Maybe they are mean and nasty to me. Maybe they make a mistake that they shouldn't make. Don't worry, I'm going to do all those things too. So when they do it, I need to show them how they need to treat me when I do it. The best way to be a leader is to learn to be a follower. Because if you are a good follower, you're teaching other people how to follow you when you're the leader. Let me say that. I bet I couldn't say that again. <laughs> <laughs> the best way to learn to be a leader is learn to find some, take somebody and find where they can be your leader and follow them. So that when it becomes your area to be a leader, they'll know how to follow you. You save yourself a lot of trouble with that. But you have to be able to be willing to be weak. You're my leader. And all of a sudden, it's bigger than just me. And we're going to strive to get, because we, we, we've got some teamwork going on here. In nothing terrified by your adversaries. Now, I love, I love the rest of that verse. Because when you're not terrified by your adversaries, which is to them, your adversaries, an evident token of perdition, but to you of, the, of salvation and that of God. When the adversaries of the gospel see you suffer, they think it's because God's cursed you. Curse God and die, Job's wife said. Those dudes in Acts 28, Paul's bit by the snake, what'd they do? They sat down to watch him die because the gods are taking vengeance on him. Must be a bad dude. Most Christians, when they suffer, most Christians, when they just get a little ridiculed by lost people, tend to lose their courage and think God's against them. That's why he writes Romans 8. Who is it that condemneth? He didn't write that because he doesn't think it's going to happen. He knows it's going to happen to you. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? People do, don't they? 
When they do, here's how you're supposed to think. He says that because he knows we have a tendency to let that affect us. Listen, just go out and stand for the gospel and accept the sufferings. Look at what he says in verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, having the same conflict you saw in me and now here to be in me. To just go on and accept the suffering as a sign of God's blessing and usefulness and as an, a, a, an evidence that you're, you are saved even if the adversary thinks it's a proof that you're wrong and lost and on your way to perdition. Because it's going to come. You're going to need to have some internal fortitude. But even God himself can't get depth out of a shallow life. Does that tell you what you need to be? The personal maturity and depth of your life has to be there. You can't get the courage out of a life that doesn't have it. And it comes through God's, it comes from relying on who God has made you, what God teaches you in His Word, knowing it's true and standing for it. And I'm going to talk to you in the next session about how we get there. I'm just trying to say today, you're going to need it. And I'm saying it to you because it's okay to need it. It's okay to be weak. It's okay to be a fool for Christ. It's okay to have people revile you for. Not for your stupidity, <laughs> but for his sake. I learned years ago when I preach to people, I don't need to beat them up. I am so amazed at how many times I listen to preachers and they, what they call good preaching is just stomping all over people. Amen. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. You're not doing the next. You're not doing it. We're not doing it. And I think, Okay. But I already knew all of that. I never, met a, I never met a believer that wanted lost people to die and go to hell. I've met a lot of believers that never talked, to, never shared the gospel with anybody. But I never, I never met a believer that, that didn't share the gospel because they just hoped everybody went to hell. Closest I ever saw anybody want somebody to go to hell be their mother-in-law. <laughs> you know the definition of mixed emotions. You remember the little moron joke? Mixed emotions, your mother-in-law driving your new Cadillac over a cliff. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> but even then, so standing up, whipping on people about not being soul winning, isn't helping them. You know what will help them? Teach them how. Build them up. Anyway, we got to quit. If you're a spectacle to the world and you stand for what we teach here, you will be. They'll look at you as foolish, your friends, your family, your associates. They will revile you. They'll defame you. Bob Jones used to say you can tell a lot about a ministry by the character of its enemies, the quality of its enemies. You need courage to stand in the face of that because it's okay if you're taking that because of the truth. It's given to you. The privilege is yours, just like the privilege to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been given the privilege to suffer for his sake having the same conflict in you that you see in Paul. So you read through those things and you say, wow. 
And can I tell you, the culture that we live in, most if you're my age, you lived in a culture that didn't do this. It's transitioning. If you're under 40 years old today, you're going to live in a world that's much different than what I lived in, what your parents lived in. But the job, the task is still the same. Now, we're going to take a break. We'll come back in here at 1030. You can go get some coffee, go to the restroom, get your Baptist beer shot, whatever you need. And we'll be back in here at 1030 for our second session, okay? Okay.